All right. So thank you, everyone, officially for the November 3rd, 2022 Community of Practice. And I'm going to turn over to our speaker, who I'm very excited to have joining us today, James Radden-Leaf. And I'm going to just go straight to you, James, and you can share your screen and introduce yourself and we can hear from you. Thanks. Can you see the slides okay? They're coming in great. Okay, well, good. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. And again, my name is James Rowlingleaf, and I'm going to introduce myself in my Lakota language. And what we'd say is, how me dapi api, kante wash den up edgy zapolo, James Rowlingleaf, imachi api na, ichango Lakota oyate. Um, I greet you um, from my heart uh, with a handshake. I am known as James Rowlingleaf, and I am a member of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe. And I'm coming to you today from the, the Black Hills of South Dakota where, man, it was cold this morning. Um, I'm not sure where you're all from, but I'm, I'm sort of getting used to this global warming climate change here. It was nice and warm and I was having fun outside and doing my sporting things, but it got cold and windy. <laughs> so so uh, we live in changing times for sure. But I, uh, I was asked to really speak on um, uh, this idea of community practice when it comes to tribal engagement. Uh, traditional ecological knowledge and really the work I've been a part of for for many years. I'll admit that I you know I've been working in this area now for over 20 years, one of 25 to be specific, uh, working in this area of uh, tribal engagement, traditional knowledge, and always been a, a focus of mine to work in that space between uh, Western science and traditional knowledge. And so today, I titled my talk the Next Gen tribal engagement as a community of practice. And there's a cool picture of a uh, tonka or a buffalo that was taken um, on at the at Wind Cave National Park here in the Black Hills. It was pretty cool. I was driving in my truck, I turned the corner, and there he was next to the road there. And I was kind of scared. And I saw all those Yellowstone videos on TikTok, you know, where people want to go pet the buffalo. And uh, at least I at least I didn't do that. But you know, we get next to those, uh, next to those, <laughs> next to those buffalo, they're pretty big. And they still have a wildness about him. And so it was cool just to, to see him and to greet him that way and to take a picture of him to know that um, that he's with us, as with the American Indian people who are still here uh, in 2020. And uh, we're looking forward to the future. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I also want to say um, uh, wish uh, wish all a Native American Heritage Month. I'm hoping that you all are doing something uh, to honor and um, and respect American Indian people in terms of this country here in America, and certainly our contributions uh, to this country as well, what we have done in the past, what we're doing now, and what we hope to do in the future. So let's let's get on with the with the presentation. So um, let's see here. Okay, so um, this slide here, uh, I just want to again honor and promote tribal college and universities. Uh, this is Sintagleshka University. It's on the Rosewood Sioux Reservation. Started in, uh, I believe it was 1969, 1970. Uh, I went to school here and graduated with a degree in Lakota Studies uh, many years ago. And after that, I, uh, I traveled, did some work, but I came back uh, and, uh, in 1998, 99, and I took a position with the university. And that's where I really began to work in this area of traditional knowledge and science. I was, I was an environmental studies major. And um, and began to look at these kind of things as well. But what I want to share with you today again is the importance of tribal college universities when it comes to working with uh, native students. And so we have 35, I think, or maybe more now across the case, across the nation, and they offer higher education to uh, to um, you know to communities and to students. And uh, and they're a success story uh, in the Indian country. Also, I wanted to recognize and, and honor one of my uh, one of my mentors. His name is Dr. Lionel Bordeaux. And when I got involved uh, with science and got involved in something called Earth Observation, Data Science Technology, uh, this is what he told me. He said, "Damn, this is a quote I want you to use when you talk about our approach, working with science or a different way of knowing." So he said, "Central Michigan University was started by its founding fathers to strengthen the Sioux Chonga Rosewood Nation in all aspects of life." As such, this initiative will assist us in bringing two of the essential points of life, the sky and the earth, together spiritually and technically. I always found this, um, this title very encouraging to me 
as I went down the road to build programs with our tribal colleges because it's very difficult. And knowing the history of science and technology and at times uh, it's negative impact on our people, uh, yet we know that it's part of where we need to go as well. And so I'm really grateful for his leadership. And I know um, I wanna recognize him today too. Well, he's not doing well with his health and many people may know him or know of him. I know he's struggling with the health today. So I wanted just to send him good prayers and, um, and well wishes and also uh, in, the, in a speedy recovery. When I was working um, and, and trying to develop a philosophical foundation of how we bring science and, and data uh, with our cultures, I, I was inspired by this image. It's three men on the hill. They're, it's looking. The title of it's looking for the next campsite. And and you know when I when this was brought to me and when we talked about it and thought about it, it was a good uh, image of kind of as indigenous people and how we work with new things that come into our culture. And so you notice there's a horse. You notice there's a gun. And so those are things that we incorporated in our culture. And some things we made a relative like the horse. And it became part of who we are. But also, these men had the responsibility of gathering information and, and taking it to decision makers. And I was always inspired by, by them in terms of how they had to be very uh, observant. They were observational experts, domain experts in what they knew about the land, about other cultures, other tribes, the atmosphere, the weather, uh, even changes in, in, in landscape or even changes in wildlife, even the, uh, the climate and so at some point. So, so I use this really to, as, as a reminder to all of us again, especially indigenous communities. And I do speak to a lot of indigenous communities about the work that I do and remind them that our, our people are adapt, are, have adaptive capacity through, the, through time immemorial. That we are able to look at things and then figure out how we use them in ways that help us in, in for the future. So that's, uh, that's three bit on the hill. And that's been the work that we talk about and how we frame the work that we do going forward. And as an example, again, you know, I talked about my importance work with data. Uh, if you are a data scientist or work with data yourself, you know that it's increasingly becoming part of our decision-making process and so with tribes. But I use this winter, this is called a winter count, or quote the winter count, and it's used um, as a way to document uh, events important to the tribe, not every event, but important events. And they use their own version of iconology, iconography to to document that through colors and through shapes and through symbols. They gain us a recognition again of our ancestors and how they were able to work with information, how they were able to take oral tradition and create, a, create this, this place, this, um, this piece of information, if you will. And again, a person was responsible for this. So again, leadership was um, developed, it was practiced, and also it was a way for us to understand again these important events. And from that work, we developed something called Res Mapper. Again, it was important that we, as a community of practice, produced something that people can see, people could understand, and people can work with. So this was a product that we developed in partnership through an NSF grant. And it was to really bring data to the community, but also integrating community data, which I'll show here. But what's interesting, too, I think, as a community of practice is that we, uh, we um, we defined the, 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 the technology behind this tool. It was GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And so we had elders look at what we were doing. I, I took a laptop in front of one of our elders and I showed them GIS. I showed them maps. I showed them data, in particular, our own reservation on Rosebud. And he said that you know, what you're talking about, James, is really this title here. It's a long, long title here in Lakota. But what basically it means is that there's a relationship here happening between all things. And when we do that, it's important that it's, it's, it's done in a way that's called Wolakota, which is really akin to something like Shalom, where it's really important that we build positive, encouraging, and supportive relationships. So Res Mapper, again, these are some screenshots from it, but again, it brought different kinds of information together. Our, 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 our goal was to educate, bring awareness to community about, about information and about data and how available it can be, how it can be used in terms of application. So I really like what we did. This was probably 10 years ago we did this. But it's important you know, for, for us to remind ourselves of the process and how we got here today and what we did to really demonstrate you know, the capability of our tribe, of our community come together to develop things like this. I know there's, um, there's real interest in continuing the work and we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit more of that as, as we go forward. 
But again, I just wanna, how we got here, again, we interviewed experts, we collected traditional observations, we looked at the breadth of, of expertise in our communities. We looked at a local, regional, indigenous knowledge perspective. We thought about the history of the environment. We reminded ourselves of our, 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 what we call a keen observation of the natural world. Again, we promoted this idea that everything is connected. And finally, um, it had a seven generation perspective, meaning that you know, what we're doing today is thinking seven generations ahead in terms of what's important to our people. And so that really led to many other kinds of products here on our reservation that help support the tribe. Um, one, as you see, there's a resource, there's a land resource map of, of Dakota, and the, the green outline here are reservation boundaries. And so we really saw the, the, the potential for developing wind energy. We also did some work with housing because housing is such a need. Um, we looked at language. And this one here on top here is what code language app. And so we associated points on the map with the language. Dakota language. Uh, the middle map here is a, a soils map again, elevation map, and, and a land use land plan. Um, on the far right here uh, is a burn, is a burn, a fire we had on road, in a place called St. Francis. Again, it was a remote sensing image, and we're just talking about the kind of data that's available. And then finally, I want to honor again um, one of our elders that's still with us today. His name is um, Dr. Victor Deville, and uh, he teaches star knowledge things like that, but um, I recognize him today because he helped me and helped us on going forward with this kind of work. So I just wanna make some statements about data. And so when we collect data as tribes, we're telling our story in our, in our own way. You know, so we are promoters of data. Uh, we are information gatherers, information keepers, just as our ancestors. We look at essential information to tell a story. These new stories are being told to sustain our people and forge our future. So there's our things, why we think that way today. We know that um, in the past, maybe even today, um, we still have to be careful how we work with data. So um, in terms of working with certain entities and people who wanna work with us, we know that there are things that we need to do and not to do these things. Uh, we need to build respectful relationships. Uh, we need to include indigenous perspectives, values and protocols and worldviews. Um, there's something called free and prior informed consent. Uh, that's from the UNDRIP principles, UNDRIP document, as you know, many know. So we we promote that. But also we know that not all data is good data. So we want to make sure that is not inconsistent or irrelevant or for quality and make sure it's, it's put and taken in, in, in developed in good context. And finally, I think, you know, what we do on Rosebud and others, we promote research that reflects our indigenous needs and our indigenous priorities. Again, so when we, we collect data, we're telling our stories. Uh, we're information gatherers, that's our ancestors. We look at information to tell our stories and these new stories are being told to stay in our future. So again, why, why, does, why do we focus on data and why would I talk about that today? It's, it's because of, of this idea of nation building. You know, we're asking the question again of our leaders, they're asking me, they're asking us, you know, how can data facilitate nation building on our tribe? How do we collect better data? Uh, it's really interesting now we're in election period here and I know People talk about information, talk about voting and how protected that can be. It's really interesting. We also think in those terms as well as how do we protect our data? How do we collect better data? And then how do we build data governance? Um, it's important that we think about these things. We build structures and policies that do that. Again, we wanna build a community of practice. I mentioned the Lakota people are people who work uh, with many allies. And so to build a community of practice on data sovereignty and data governance is important. And finally, we want to share these things that we learn. And I know across Indian country and even across the world. So those are some, some, some things that what we call data enabled trust. So in the past, you know, we, we had never been consulted on our information that was gathered on us. Um, who should gather that? Uh, who should maintain it? Um, who should act, access to it? And then uh, how relevant that is to our needs as well and our concerns. But because it's been imposed upon us, outside authorities, um, you know, it was met with a great resistance, but these points I'm making today is truly really to address uh, these past um, inequalities. And so it's important for us as indigenous people that we understand these things so that we can, uh, we can go forward. Also, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, climate change and the work I do there as well. Again, this is a project we did with the USGS. Again, it was linking uh, winter count information to um, uh, Western science, um, understandings and outlooks of weather and climate. And it was really good. And Victor DeVille was the leader of that. But again, it used 
winter counts are really good to maybe correlate some things that were important at that time, but also where do we take that from here? Uh, Buffalo, uh, Buffalo Treaty. Again, this is another effort that I'm in part of. It's an effort led uh, by um, a man named Dr. Little, Leroy Little Bear from Alberta. Um, I've been invited to two meetings here these past few years where I was asked to speak on climate. And so I did that and I, um, I, I titled my talk, Buffalo Cultural Heritage, Climate Change, Challenges and Opportunities for Tribes. And that was a great gathering and it continues to go forward. Also in this work, uh, I've been asked to participate in a film while singing back to Buffalo. Again, so th these ideas of bringing together people, uh, developing different kinds of communication strategies like film, again, talking about the Buffalo and the importance of Buffalo and connection to land, but also to the people and to the cultures and why that matters to us as indigenous people. Uh, our voices need to be heard. Uh, we need platforms to share those voices. And now that we have that, um, it's important that we do that. Uh, just today as a side note on, on Good Morning America, it was a program that highlighted uh, Native American Heritage Month and they were talking about different films. Uh, Res Dogs was one of them, if you have not heard of it. Um, that was on Hulu, I think, but they were talking to the actors and the importance of American Indian people being part of Hollywood and being writers and being actors and being part of the whole industry. So anyway, they said 1% of Hollywood is American Indian or indigenous. So I thought that was interesting. Um, also this work has allowed me to work across the country. And so I'm part of this effort called the Geo-Indigenous Alliance established in uh, about two and a half years ago in Canberra, Australia. And through the last two and a half years, I got to participate in many different things. Again, the important part I think of this is um, I got my tribe, the Road Sioux Tribe, to endorse me and to support me with a resolution from the Treaty Council to attend and represent our tribe and to participate also as a, as a delegate from, from the United States of America. And so I gave, I gave uh, your intervention there in Canberra two and a half years ago, representing America as well. And I talked about Buffalo, I talked about data, and I talked about Lakota culture. It was a tremendous opportunity. Uh, we have a website called the Geo, just Google Geo Digital Alliance. Uh, we've been doing a number of things there that um, I think has relevance here as well. Uh, these are things that across many different indigenous peoples. So there's an interest for international knowledge transfer from elders to young people. Again, I mentioned data sovereignty, data self-governance. We need to prepare a workforce for the future. How do we, how do, we do that? Uh, and also it's important that we honor and strengthen our cultural heritage. And so we focus on women and youth, climate action, food security is an area, disaster risk resilience, the importance of current communities working there and also data, uh, indigenous data sovereignty. So we develop protocols again to working together. And I think that's also relevant for our discussion today is we're working and develop, continue to improve upon our training materials. Uh, we work with advisory groups of indigenous representatives. Again, we have developed principles for engagement uh, for our work. And finally, um, we're, we wanna understand how our work is, is being done, the importance of it, but also are we making a difference? So we're working on a indigenous impact assessment right now when it comes to using, um, using data in indigenous communities. Again, we, we talk and we promote this idea of, of UNDRIP uh, through, um, through the geo Digital Alliance, but also we know that this work is happening in America through this kind of work. I just wanted to profile this work from NARF, parallel law about the importance of developing these toolkits for implementing uh, UNDRIP and tribal, tribal nations, which I thought was really interesting. And I think part of this work also is encouraging and supporting efforts like this. Um, you know, with climate change and, and with the work of protecting cultural heritage, you know, it's important that we work with our, our knowledge holders on reservations. And this is one example. Um, uh, I know uh, uh, Dr. Linda Black Elk, and she's done a great job in promoting the use of, um, of data collection, data research, and uh, tribal cultural protocols to collect information about culturally important plants to the Lakota people in our area here. So this is a project that's ongoing, and I think it'll always be ongoing. But if you notice that City Bowl College is part of the recipient of this, and so again, there's disclaimers here, again, talking about the importance of how we do this work, but also the importance of understanding that we have to think about all these things in terms of uh, protecting and working uh, in this way. Again, you know that this 2001, the Met White House Summit, again, this, this administration has been very supportive of the tribal nations and we are part of that work. You know, we, we uh, participate in this work and I think it's important that we do that. And we notice that 
Um, climate change, I think, is one of the, the focus areas, uh, treaty rights and sacred lands. All those things are things that, that we've been working in a way, but also trying to promote this work within, within our tribes. Now I want to shift a little bit to um, some other work I'm part of. It's called the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center. And this is a map of our area that we work in. And you notice this is the largest, um, again, um, how would I say, this is the largest uh, number of tribal partners in this region for our, we call CAST, um, and also the largest number of tribal colleges in our CAST. So it's a tremendous diversity of cultures here that we are charged to work with. And uh, they're all different in so many ways, similar, but different in so many ways. And so it takes um, a number of, of leadership protocols, efforts you know, to bring you know, benefits to the tribes when it comes to working with climate adaptation science and data. But, but we're doing that. And the, pro the progress has been slow just because of the number of, uh, of the tribes and how we work with them, how we work with them well. But um, anyway, we're working with them. That's, I wanted to share that with you and promote. And also, by the way, uh, the CASC have been funded by the federal government, both Republicans and Democrats both support the CASCs, and this is run through the USGS. So I thought that's really interesting. So it's a good, good network. It's a nationwide network of, of, uh, of these regions that work together to advance climate adaptation. And I'm really uh, happy to announce this as well. In our work at the CASC, we developed this Travel Climate Leaders Program. And it's important, that, as I mentioned, preparing the, the next generation um, for climate. And so we have this new program. It's a master's program, fully funded, Fellowship program, and we these are pictures of five students that we uh, that we recruited and brought into the program, and they're doing very well. So there are, there are many of them on the last year. COVID kind of slowed it down a little bit, but again, it's important that um, that we do this work. And it, it took a lot of money to do this first cohort. You know, education is very expensive, but in any event, uh, it's there. We're hoping to build a next cohort here soon. Uh, again, we, we thank the University of Colorado Boulder and their leadership for investing in this program, but also investing in these in tribal youth. And I think, again, I would also say that we're encouraging uh, these five youth. Again, it's not written down, it's not a requirement, but we're asking them to, to give back uh, to, the, to their tribes, to work with the tribes, support the tribes on any climate adaptation project. So that there's a reciprocal value we're promoting through this so that the students are not just getting a free education, but, but they're actually giving back to their tribes. So we're looking forward to some of those projects going forward here in the near future. Also, uh, when I met Stephanie and she was all interested in the work that we're doing at ESA. So uh, I serve as the, uh, as the chair of the ESA, Galactic America Traditional Ecological Knowledge Section. And there, these last two years as chair, I promoted uh, the idea of traditional knowledge. And this again, this was based on the administration's interest and in the memorandum on coming down, uh, encouraging federal agencies to consider traditional knowledge and management decisions on federal lands. So going forward, we as a, as a science organization, nonprofit, began to delve into uh, the work with tribal nations and TEK. And from that work, uh, we came up with um, a webinar series. And so on the right there, you'll see all the titles of the 12 or so indigenous scholars who came and supported us to do this work. And you look at the titles of tremendous, tremendous topics, very relevant topics. And um, we even had the, had the people from the White House come and speak to us on March 11th. The pictures on, on the left there are um, the scholars who joined us at a meeting in Montreal this past year. And they're there to help us design some new curriculum to incorporate TEK into ecological education. So if a mainstream organization like ESA can begin to work uh, intentionally, uh, progressively, and incrementally to work with us as scholars to bring judicial knowledge into a curriculum to help train future ec ecologists, and then and that's what we're doing. And finally, that picture, I had to put that picture in there. Um, so we were in Montreal, and part of our work is to acknowledge and recognize the local indigenous people that we're on. So the Haudenosaunee were there and we had an elder help us with a culture event, help us with song and help us with our workshop in terms of opening and closing it, giving us the cultural grounding that we need to do this kind of work because we talk about traditional knowledge, we talk about our cultures. It was a wonderful opportunity and as, as a leader of that stuff, uh, we tend to get recognized, but you know it's a lot, all of us who do the work. So I, was, I was gifted a squash 
the yellow thing there's a squash that was gifted by the elder. And he said he was a, a very, it was from a very old seed and yeah, very old seeds. And so they really promote uh, food sovereignty and the work there at the Haudenosaunee. And well, what an honor to receive that gift from the elder. And so we I passed it on to one of my, co my Canadian uh, colleagues that could not bring it across the border. Um, or I've still been in Canada now, I'm afraid I got in trouble. But, but it's really good that, again, uh, my point here is that these organizations have an opportunity to work with us as indigenous people to advance all of us. And TK is one of those key areas that I think uh, needs to be recognized again and we work with. And I think these kind of things can happen. So we're, I think we started something here with ESA. Um, I will be stepping down as chair here this next month. Hopefully I'll stay involved with ESA in the future, but right now we have good leadership. All those, those young men and young ladies that you see there wanna stay involved. And they're tremendous leaders in their own right in their institution, travel colleges, ancient universities, and even from tribes. So it was a great experience and hoping that we'll continue to grow from that. You know, we're in drought. And uh, I share this slide because part of my uh, community practice is to work with government organizations as well, who are, have a great interest in working with tribal government. So this is one of them. This is the National Integrated Drought Information System, called NOAA. And I've been working with them since 2008 as a consultant, supporting uh, workshops, supporting meetings, uh, building networks, and just supporting uh, the research going forward. But I just wanted to let you know that there is this effort. And um, you notice that we're working on the, something called Guiding Principles Engagement for NIDAS and NOAA. And so it's respecting travel sovereignty, trust and reciprocity, uh, dues are drought early warning systems that are culturally appropriate and, respect, and useful for travel nation. So uh, we know that drought will continue to be an issue uh, for our people and, and for our country. And so we need to get together and to develop programs that best respond to those things. Some outcomes, again, we want to promote research, prediction, forecasting, observation, monitoring, planning and preparedness and communication and outreach. Those are all parts of the major um, activities for this strategy. I mentioned again that there's a common theme of this work that I do, it's data. And so we know that we need data scientists in any country. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're, we started something called the Regional Travel Data Sovereignty Initiative here in the Great Plains. And so through this words, you see that we're really trying to figure out again, uh, the work that needs to be done with tribes. Uh, why did we choose a region? Uh, because we know that one tribe doesn't have all this stuff to do what it needs to do. So maybe through a regional approach, uh, we can build and find the technical expertise. Uh, we can understand the needs better and capabilities and really find the resources to address our training and the work that we need to do for planning. And finally, again, it's all about, you know, working across uh, boundaries to do this work. So I think that's important. You know, I was really excited to read this, this document. So on October 10th of this year, Secretary Holland announced that um, satellites or Earth observation will help us fight climate change. And so she's talking about the importance of using Earth observation, which is the work that we've been promoting for many years now. And to have the secretary come and, and announce that and encourage tribes to use this data for climate change uh, adaptation is, was really big. And we're hoping that we, we continue this effort here, this announcement with something that will bring the tribe together to understand the needs in a better way but also lay out something the government can get behind and get the federal agencies to work together to address the needs of tribes when it comes to imaging. And I, th I, I wanna read this quote because this was from Secretary Holland. She said, well, science is not a passion I pursued. I come from people who are among the first earth observers, biologists and agriculturalists. Through generations of studying the cycles of the seasons and the flow of the waters and observing their environments, Indigenous peoples built complex communities to manage Earth's natural resources. They mapped the stars and watched the moon to understand when to plant and harvest. And they practiced conservation as the first stewards of our lands and water. The tremendous quote. And I'm real grateful that Secretary Holland is in the position she is. We're hoping that we can build upon these kind of statements and this kind of interest and, and also the kind of funding. So part of that work also, I mentioned Earth observation, so just make sure that we all understand again, it's gathering of information about the planet's Earth physical, chemical, and biological systems via remote sensing technologies, usually involving satellites carrying imaging devices. So I've been asked um, 
as a travel consultant in the Percy Birkin is there for many years now to support a new mission from NASA called SBG. And so SBG stands for Surface Biology and Geology. So it's a new mission and it's not scheduled to launch until I think it's 20, 2028, 2029. But what's interesting about this, this process here and why I'm involved in it is because they really wanna build a mission with indigenous voices, indigenous ideas, indigenous needs and traditional knowledge as part of the design from the beginning. And so we'll see more and more of the efforts going forward with this, but I just sort of wanted to let you know that, that this stuff kind of things are happening and, and, and I get to be involved in it. And when I'm involved in it, I, I think I, I try to bring you know, authentic uh, indigenous voice to this work. And we're looking that to build upon this, to bring other voices in, uh, travel colleges, students, uh, indigenous people, as we design this mission, what it's gonna do, how it's gonna do it, and what the benefits that will be for tribal people. So we wanna make sure that we do that. And so we're on the ground floor of this mission and we're looking forward uh, to great results. Uh, part of my work also uh, is at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so we're launching, we've launched this new center. It's called, the, it's called EASL, Environmental Data Science Innovation and Inclusion Lab. So it's an NSF funded data synthesis center led by University of Colorado Boulder. And so my role in that is to work with tribal nations and tribal college and tribal students. And again, um, we're talking about data science education and training, uh, building inclusive participation in diverse groups, and finally cutting edge team science. So again, these are opportunities that are before us today. Wanted you to make sure that you are aware of it. And, and as, we, as we began to develop a communication strategy for this work, you'll see, hopefully you'll see more and more, you'll be interested in this, and that um, you all maybe will have a, another session sometime down in the future when we're kind of established. And again, we got some things to talk about more. But again, it's important to understand again that as we go forward, you know, tribal voices need to be part of, of this kind of work. And now we have that. So how we roll that out is going to be important. We're going to leverage every community practice that we know. Certainly, I'm going to do that with my work and to build a team of indigenous uh, scholars and such to do this work. So as we go forward, we know that it's important that we, we do engagement with communities in different ways. And so I share these three posters with you just to make you aware again about what tribes are thinking about when it comes to different things like climate, uh, nation building. And so the first, first one I wanna share is a natural law conference called Makasi Domini, protecting water, land, air, and environment through sovereignty, adjusting the new green deal and climate change. So all three of these events, I, I got to participate and I got to learn and, and get to know the leaders from this area again. Uh, the last one uh, is the uh, Wind River Climate Summit. That was a youth, a youth effort, which was really cool. Again, that was on the Wind River Indian Reservation in Wyoming. But the middle one, I'll talk about that a little bit more, but I'm holding off on that. But that's the Ochepi Shankoni. Again, the, I mentioned the Great Sioux Nation again. They're already coming together around climate adaptation and trying to plan for how we work together as a region. So Ochepi Shankoni is, is, is really being, means the people of the seven council fires, also known as the Great Sioux Nation. So there's a map there that was some historical areas that we occupied. Uh, that we worked in, lived in, and uh, and so there's an effort now to rebuild this. And so we have a, a logic a logic chart here, um, logic um, tool here. We'll talk about what we want to do with this thing. And so you know it's more than just climate or more than just data, but it really talks about what we're trying to do through this Ocheti, how it affects each individual tribe in our great our great Sioux Nation. So we work at the national level. The system level, community level, family level, and the community level. Um, we have these outcomes. We want to improve all these different things, right? All what a nation would 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 it would matter to them. And so these are things that are happening right now. Um, I get to be part of that, uh, this work, and it's important that we um, that we do these things and we do the things the way we we think is important. So this is a letter. Um, um, from, from Rodney Borda, who is our past president. And I'm sharing this because what, what this letter did was it authorized uh, the Rosebud tribe to start a climate change working group. And so here is a resolution again, passed by the tribal council. And just want to share what, what the resolution was trying to do was to develop a climate change working group, was to look at the impacts of climate on our tribe, uh, develop an adaptation plan, create an educational communication strategy, and finally to think about a center a focal point for this work. And so we came out with a plan. So this was dropped about three months ago. 
approved by the tribal council. So we have a plan now called the Sinchang Lakota Yati plan. And again, you, know, you see the recommendations there focus, ensure focus and accountability, protecting the Oyate of the people, protecting our water, fully implement the Rosebud Drought Response Plan, and protect our sovereignty, establish the Chungo Lakota Oyate Environmental Data and Decision Center. That's that's been pretty first time we ever did this. And we're hoping that uh, this will help you know, generate and lead other tribes in our region to do the same. But I'm also happy to announce today. And I got this email yesterday um, um, from our president, uh, Scott Herman. And uh, we were noticed, we got noticed yesterday that um, our proposal for a $2 million funding for our new climate center that was part of the plan is, will come to fruition. Uh, and we're really excited that this has happened. We're grateful for the BIA and the Climate Resilience Program to, to give, us a, give us this opportunity to work with them. And so we're excited about this. And we're hoping that as the center begins to build, build and build out, that there may, may be a role for the Udall Center and the Udall Partners when it comes to working on things like um, ECR and conflict resolution, and even things that's going to help us as a center, as a tribal center, uh, be useful, be relevant, and, and to help lead in so many ways that we need to. Uh, some of the areas that the center will focus on is data science, data governance, so that. <laughs> Some of the things I've been doing for the last five years now, are, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll have a home. Uh, there will be a really important part of traditional knowledge. So we really want to promote language and, and Lakota um, ways of knowing in our own ceremonies and practices as part of the, part of the center. So it'll be right next to Western science and how it goes forward. Uh, we want to look at uh, workforce development as well. How do we, how do we bring back those, those uh, climate fellows or climate leaders into our work with us? How do we, how do we advance understanding of of water and work with climate models and things that's already out there, but we need a workforce to do that. How do we develop something now in this COVID area where we can hire uh, people to work on things, but they don't have to necessarily be on the reservation or be on, in the community. So things like that are important. And finally, you know, there's a great effort to really partner, uh, partner and and to sustain this. So that'll be my job with the center is to build partnership and really be the sustainability officer for the center. How do, we, how do we fund it past the grant year? Um, how do we bring new funding in? And how do we advance it in a way through these really good communication channels? So that's exciting news for us. Um, as we get close here to the end, I wanted to just kind of go a little bit deeper into an area that, that I also found pretty interesting. So this is a picture of an area of some land that was recently purchased by the Wind Cave National Park uh, in South Dakota in the part of the Black, uh, the Black Hills. And so I was asked to facilitate a consultation meeting with 17 tribes. And so we did that uh, here in October. And you know, again, the idea was that how do we bring uh, through this consultation process, uh, tribal voices to the table, and also begin to think about things like co-management, co-stewardship, and, um, and but even backing up before that, uh, do, do we really understand as a park, as tribal people, what's here, what's on this land? what's part of uh, the resources, but the cultural resources. You know, should we open this up to uh, hiking and uh, visitors and tourism? And so we had these questions before us. Um, you know, how should we try to manage this jointly? Um, should we develop M MOUs? So there was a great, great discussion for two days where we talked about all these important matters. And, and for me, it was the beginning of, of how we do this kind of work. How do we bring science into this, into mapping? How do we bring traditional knowledge? And a lot of times, one of the things that, that we heard as feedback was we began our first meeting out there on the land. So it was a beautiful day. Our first day, we brought our people together. We brought our elder together and opened this up in a prayer and a song and reminded us again why we're coming together. Because as you know, a lot of these consultation meetings can be very contentious. But we thought it was important as, as the planners for this consultation that we be on the land, that we see the land with our own, we experience it, we walk on it, we do our, our prayers and ceremonies to address what we need to address so that when we go into those meetings in a room, a four wall room that we're reminded again the importance of what we're trying to do, not only for now, but for the future. Also, I wanted to say that this is also part of a effort that I'm a part of working with national parks too in climate change is really this idea of reconnection to the land. The idea of reconciling uh, people to the land, reckon ourselves to the land, 
and reconciles to each other as people. We know our history of this land, and it's not an easy history to talk about. Certainly for the Native side, it's been a very difficult experience for us. But as Lakota people, you know, we're, we're in this for the long haul. And so being a part of this project has been really instrumental for me as a tribal person, but also as a person who works in the space really to better understand uh, what, what do we do now? And what have we learned from the past? How to do these, these agreements? How do we do these MOUs? But also how do we teach about the land, teach about this land? You are a visitor coming from somewhere. You came to this land. You saw this overreach. What will we tell you? What's most important to talk about the land, and in terms of education and things like that. So, so one of the other outcomes I'll share before I'll move on is that um, the tribal leaders there asked the National Park Service if there would be opportunity for them just to come and camp, um, camp at some time in the future, or just to be on the land for a number of days and time, just to be there out there on the land and to experience it again as tribal people. So that's, I think that's pretty interesting as well. Before any decision is made, you know, we wanna make sure that we know what's here, we wanna be here, and we wanna bring our elders and such and also be part of it. So it was pretty cool, it was an honor to be a part of this. Also in these, as far as tools, I wanted to share with you in terms of community practice, you know, we have something called the World of the Learning Model. And we've been, we've been using this um, approach to work with people as it comes to doing things, uh, beings before doing, listen deeply, doing beyond, doings behind beings and share deeply. So beings are placed ahead of doings, listen deeply to a being, to come to know that being by his or her own definitions. Doing is uh, the stories, the values, accomplishments of others are heard, appreciated and the wisdom of fellow beings. Sharing deeply the truth of my own doings, my name, story, value, accomplishments, comes in response to deep listening and with the goal of mutual understanding. So Wolokota is an important part of this work that we do, that I do, in terms of working with organizations to understand each other better and to go forward. Also, uh, another tool that I've been using, again, and sharing with you is cultural intelligence. Again, it's a capability to work with someone different than yourself really made up of four components, your, your drive, which is your interest, your confidence in engaging multicultural situations. It's your knowledge. The next step is your knowledge, understanding cultural similarities. Then your strategy. When you go into a multicultural situation, how do you prepare for that? And finally, your action. When you're in that moment, um, if things change, if things are different uh, than you expect, it's your ability, again, to successfully adapt in those situations so you can keep the relationship going, keep it building, so that you can do work together. And I always remind people that, you know, there's a cultural iceberg. Again, what you see uh, with your eyes, the visible, there's so much more underneath that surface, the less visible, and even the not visible. So it's important that we acknowledge and we work with indigenous people, you know, we're an iceberg, <laughs> like any other culture. And so it's important to recognize that going forward. And cultural intelligence, I think, is a, is a useful tool and to work with others. And I've used it as well with my other work with other cultures as well. Um, finally, as we get close here, I um, want to recognize again the work that's been done at the Inuit Circumpolar Council. Again, these are protocols. You know, nothing about us without us. Always engage. Recognize our knowledge in its own right. Practice good governance. Communicate with intent. Exercise accountability by building trust. Build meaningful partnerships. Information and data sharing, ownership and permissions. And equitably fund uh, Inuit representation and knowledge. I think these call calls are always a good reminder for me, again, as I go into meetings and go into projects and even go into webinars like this, of how we conduct ourselves, you know, how we do these things. Again, it's always meaningful, it's always important, and it builds that respect that we need to do work together. Um, I was reading uh, the book, God is Red, this week, and I came across this quote by um, the late Wendell Lurie Jr. He said, who will find peace with the lands? The future of mankind lies for those who will come to understand their lives and take up the responsibilities of all living things. Who will listen to the trees, the animals, the birds, the voices of the places of the land as the long forgotten peoples of the respective continents rise and begin to reclaim their, their ancient heritage. They'll discover the meaning of the lands of their ancestors. That's when the invaders of the North American continent will finally discover that this is that for this land, God is red. And the late Albert Whitehead, also my mentor, said, if we're going to save the earth, 
you need to communicate with creation. I advise you to go back to creation, talk to them. The only way we can save our grandmother of the earth is to get reattached. I admonish young people not to wait. It's good to communicate with your relatives. Again, that's the other white hat. And so we know that um, there is a need to restore the balance and care for people on the earth. Human problems and environmental problems have not improved in spite of our technologies and increased wealth. We need to raise a consciousness of people. We need all ways of knowing. And so as we conclude here, I want to show this picture. These are people that I know. These are people I've worked with um, through my 25 years of this kind of work. And I acknowledge them today and to share that with you that uh, we all don't get where we're at by ourselves. And that's an indigenous value. Maybe it's a cultural value that we all need to remind ourselves again that, that we're not alone. I'm certainly not alone because in my tribe, in my culture, in my Toshitai, and even my immediate family, that we have the support that we have. And we have the knowledge, I think, that we have. Now it really becomes our responsibility uh, to implement those things in good ways that help advance all of us. So I want to share that with you and say, all my relatives, and I thank you all very much. And I just put that really cool WhatsApp QR code. So if you want to connect to me through with WhatsApp, you're welcome to take a photograph of that, if you will. I'll leave that up for a moment. And with that, Stephanie, that concludes my uh, my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, James. It's always great hearing all of the, the great work and connections you've made, um, both in your work and your lifetime. So really appreciate you sharing that with us. We actually did get one question in the chat, and I'm sure there's other folks that are eager to talk to you, but... Um, and I think you covered this, but Larry Schuler, Schuler was asking, you know, what your thoughts are on good collaboration, communication, you know, what constitutes um, that process of getting good data mm. and maybe what constitutes bad data? Like, what are some things to keep an eye out for? And Larry, please jump in if I mischaracterize that at all. Well, that's a um, that's a great question. And I know that. Um, you know, the work that we've, we've been doing with, uh, for instance, like the Res Mapper project, uh, even though that was, you know, over 10 years ago, you know, what we did with that was, um, you know, we started with awareness. We spent a lot of time, you know, talking about the idea. We didn't develop anything yet. Uh, we just talked about it. We said, here are some maps of the reservation. We showed paper maps. Then we brought in some, some digital maps and we just had conversations with key people in our community. So that's number one, the leadership matters. So finding those people in the community that, that people listen to, to talk with them first and begin to get their thoughts in the beginning. Um, I think code development is a key part of what I always do, which means that you know we, we work on things together in a way that we, we take ownership of it together and we learn together as we do this work. A lot of the data, a lot of times when dealing with data, you gotta deal with the past you got to deal with those instances where, you know, where there were stories of people stole things or stole information or, or took things without permission. So you always have to have a, a, a reason or explanation for this and how, how what you're talking about is going to be different. And that's why you're there in the first place is to hear that, to learn their story, but also say, you know what, um, we're going to do this in a different way. Um, I think the kind of, I mentioned accountability a couple of times in my talk. You know, we all have to be accountable to one another when it comes to working with data. Um, if the policies are in place now to work with and protect tribal data, then we need to work together to develop those policies so that tribal data is protected, is maintained, and so that and the work that we do together um, will be useful to the community. And I, and again, I think the whole idea about it is uh, building a whole new workforce, getting students involved in the project itself. Um, there's, sometimes there's no better advocate you can have is having young people part of projects and have them learn and be with you. And so as they talk with their peers, as they see they're part of the work, they're getting to understand the importance of data and how it can be helpful to tribal nations in terms of research or education, uh, decision making, then I think you, know, you have with those ingredients, with those um, ideas, principles, you're more likely to have a successful project. Stephanie, do you mind if I just uh, follow Absolutely. up? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Adelaide, I, I appreciate that. I think what I was particularly interested in was the slide where you made reference to consulting with tribes around the data. I, I don't know exactly how the slide worded it, but but what I was trying to understand is, you know, what does it look like when we are, you know, using best practices specifically on consulting tribes about 
data, I, I guess I was trying to understand it. Is it is it understanding what the tribes think about what data should be collected, or are we asking them how accurate data is, or some mm -hmm. combination of that? I just I wanted to dive more deeply into that. That component. yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I know um, you know for us, you know, on Rosebud, for instance, you know, when we uh, you do those projects, or when researchers do come and want to work. And, and look at collecting data. And, and so there's always uh, these initial consultations, if you will, too, to talk about the, you know, framing out what the project will be and try to do it in a, in a meantime, in a, in a way that is understand by both parties. Um, I think also our, our IRB, Institution Review Board, IRB on Rosebud is, has been very good about that kind of work uh, and been very, um, I'd say, robust in, uh, in their structure and their policy and their documentation to do that. I think um, our child historic preservation officers, I didn't mention them today, um, but TIPOs have a key role to play in this as well when it comes to working with cultural data, whether it's human subjects or, or land or water. Uh, so I think, you know, each tribe is at a different place in how they work with these things. But for what, for us on Rosebud, you know, we've we made progress in developing uh, the understanding and capability to negotiate if we have to, even to say free and prior informed consent do we want this project or no? I know there have been many instances where you said no to a project and uh, that researcher went away. So I think, you know, to be, to be positioning yourself to be successful, um, you'll have to do that up front and work, you know, right away. And uh, key people in the government's important, um, relevant people within the cultural side, like the TIPO is important. And again, um, working through the process uh, of, of um, documentation and what that looks like through our IRB are all key elements to do any kind of project in Rosebud, for instance, or maybe other tribes. Thank Thanks, you very much. Jim. I, I really appreciate how you're you're framing that. It also strikes me, James, is like what I've heard, and I know some of our colleagues on the phone have heard in our discussions, like good data versus bad data data, that it's not just the data, it's why was it collected? Who was it collected by? Who was it collected with? What were the questions that were asked um, about? The, was the right questions asked? Was it done? I think you said it best, and I'm probably going to misphrase it because you did say it best, was just um, done together collaboratively in partnership. Was that, how was that data? So for me, I, I, I appreciate it because we, uh, we're hearing a lot about data and also thinking through what makes good data and bad data, I think is a good question for us as facilitators, as well as who's who's in the room, who's who's having these conversations. So I really appreciate that, James. And great question, Larry. Any other questions for James? I, I think we we have a, a short time today. We we seem to always ha have this where we get great speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give me a microphone. <laughs> I love That's giving hard. you a microphone. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna pull James's uh your your uh thing down just so we could see everybody. If that's okay. okay. I'll stop share here. Right, Excellent. Okay. Any other thoughts or questions for James? I think you're getting some thank yous. <laughs> uh Alex. Uh, it says Alex Associates. So, <laughs> <laughs> hi, this is um, Betsy. We're trying to get the camera right. There's a bunch of us in the room here. Uh, there we are. Hi, and uh, hi, James. My name is Betsy, and uh, you know we often are find ourselves working as non-Indian people working to help the federal government and Indian people work together in that collaborative role. And so one of the things I really look to number as a non-Indian person, look to a number of tribal people over time to help um, mentor us. And you know, sometimes the word is ally for tribal people. And so I just wondered your advice for non-Indian people, how we can best support the work that you're doing and, and as an ally. Mm. Well, that's a great question. And thank you for the question. Uh, certainly. Um, you know, we have, you know, I think we have good examples uh, of, uh, of allies out there. And um, I do appreciate that. Um, one thing that I need to say as well is, you know, as we put together those climate adaptation plans and projects for Rosebud, we had a, we had a combination of Native and non-Native uh, folks on that. And these were 
I would say what I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit and say, you know, I got to bring that team together, uh, recruit them, if you will, to work with us. And though it's led by the tribe, which was right, these allies also understood that, understand that this is a tribe by the project, by the tribe, for the tribe. And, and though the tribe is still building its capacity, I think there'll always be a need for allies. But even beyond that, I would say it's better that we're working together on stuff instead of just you here, me here, and, and that. I think the better way, and what I believe in, in my personal opinion, is that we need each other just because of the importance of, of these idea of different ways of knowing and we need those different ways of knowing. Um, I, I think about it too now as a grandfather, believe it or not, I know I don't look like it, <laughs> but I'm a grandfather. Yeah, first time this year, I got, I got two beautiful uh, grandson and a granddaughter in this last two years now. And, what happens when you become a grandfather, I guess, is that you realize that, um, and my grandchildren are of, of different ethnicities. So what am I gonna do? You know, I mean, I, I'm not gonna parse up my grandchild and say, you're this, you're that. I'm gonna love my grandchild. And, and I'm looking, and it's, and it's beautiful because they're diverse. They have different ethnicities in, in them. And I'm excited to know you know what they're gonna do in their lives. But my, I, I say that because I, I, my perspective is growing in how we work with one another and how we understand each other. Um, you know, I've been doing, I was in, um, I was in Baltimore, Maryland last, last week for the National Adaptation Forum. I got to moderate and also be part of some panels. And again, I'm amazed again Change about all our allies that we've had that wanna work or have been working with indigenous people. But let me just be an encouragement to you to keep on going, uh, keep doing it. Um, always, you know, practice the four R's I call them respect, relevance, uh, reciprocity, and relationality. You know, do those four R's consistently with your indigenous allies and you'll become a relative. You'll become a relative if you're not already. And that's one of the highest, um, highest values in indigenous cultures from my perspective that you can achieve is to be a good relative. And people, any people will know that. And I think that's important. So, so keep doing the good work. We need all hands. Um, we don't have all the answers either. So that's why I'm here with you. Um, I know that. I already believe that. And so I try to practice what I preach. And so anyway, that'd be my response. Thank you so much, James. Thank you. Thank you, James. And I think we're at time. And I, I kind of want to end it at such a wonderful and high note of, the, of your four R's, James. Um, I think uh, Seth had a question. Seth's my colleague on just um, sharing data. If, if you wanted to cover that or folks needed to jump off, I did want to appreciate everybody's time as well as yours. But um, I don't know, Seth, if you wanted to speak a little bit more about sometimes the tensions of um, you know evaluating projects and the potential impact on a community and taught and the the tensions of what data can or shouldn't be shared or the trust with sharing data and its impacts on a project, if you have any thoughts, particularly when that data involves traditional knowledge or experience that you've had with that? Well, that's a great question. And, and I know that there's, there's a lot of people thinking about these things and I, I'm getting, I'm here just to promote the idea of data sovereignty, data, federal data governance, the importance of that, because those are opportunities, I believe that, um, that, that we're missing out on if we don't do that well. Um, I do think that the body of scholarship, as I understand it, still looks at those care principles and those fair principles. Um, I think just understanding uh, what those mean is a good start. The care principles, fair principles that comes to data and how that data is used by communities. I think we all need to understand that for the work of tribal communities, especially as science organizations. So I encourage you to do that. Um, I think, you know, like for our particular project in Rosewood, the Rest Mapper project, you know, we had agreements in place even before any data was collected. Uh, we had some family stories in that product that, that we didn't, I didn't share with you today, but, but they're there and required the family approval and consent for them to share that. Um, I do think that um, agreements are a matter. I think memory understandings are good instruments, though not legally binding. They still lay out the responsibilities of each party and how they work with data. But I do think this is an area that obviously is We'll, we'll, we'll go deeper and deeper and it'll have implications, I think, for, for science and for research in particular, um, those federal agencies like NSF who work a lot, spend a lot on research. We're hoping that there's gonna be progress there through NSF and other leading type of research entities that you know think about this stuff every day. 
And uh, as we build our own capacity as indigenous researchers, scholars, and, and, and thinkers, um, I do believe that we'll come to a, a, an understanding. We'll come to an agreement on what this is. But I would say, in my opinion, we're not there yet, but I do think that we're in the right direction. And I think um, you all, again, can be a part of that discussion when it comes to ECR, um, you know, being conflict resolution people uh, to work in those spaces as well. And I swear we did not plan this, but we actually do have a webinar from Native Nations Institute on the care <laughs> principle. So we'll put that in the chat box. We didn't coordinate okay. with James, I swear. No. no, I didn't. I didn't know that, but I'm happy to, <laughs> happy to talk about that with you. I know, happy. Uh, but we have a resource for folks on that. Um, any other questions or did you have any follow up to that, Seth? I saw you came on camera. No, no, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, James. No, I mean, I, I know time is short, so I can always follow up separately. Um, yeah, I was thinking I was thinking about particular challenging projects like a, a pipeline going through where they don't necessarily look at the whole tribal landscape, you know, they look more at the the immediate areas next to the project. And it's hard to communicate some of those, those impacts, I think, and yet yeah, wanting to protect the, that information. Um, but it's there's that's so that was a tension I was thinking of that I'd heard I'd heard of on some previous things that I had facilitated in the past. So appreciate it. Well, well, I think you know that could be a good area for expansion, you know, for you all, you know, as a mediator and somebody that you know could be a trusted, you know, broker in these times of time. So trying to bring those projects into the other data. I'd love to see something like that if that already doesn't exist. I'll For just the expansion of the data collection? Well, just uh, mediation. You know, how do you frame, you know, how do you, like we just said about the importance of data, how important is it in those mediations when it comes to environmental projects and conflict resolution? You know, can data be built and developed and to be trusted to make, you know, uh, to make parties come to understand and come to agreement? I don't know, but it'd be interesting to know that. I think it'd be helpful to us uh, in our new climate center, as we work with uh, a land tenure system, uh, we're a checkerboard reservation, if the audience knows what that means. And so we have um, a non-native people who live within the boundaries of the reservation that are really utilizing a resource like water that uh, we have no authority over. And so when we talk about conservation, we talk about adaptation, water planning, you know, yet we have you know, these irrigators and stuff right there, you know, doing whatever they want with the water resource. And so, I think those kind of issues are are still right there in front of us, and uh, we still need you know, processes, better processes, uh, better tools, and even data to help validate and verify uh, these issues with the resource, like irrigation, and how it impacts um, our overall aquifer. I know it's complex, uh, a lot of it, but I know that um, I know that concerns us on Rosebud, and so I know our climate center will will build um, a water resource information system to, to, to develop and collect that data so that it could be used for modeling and be incorporated into other climate models in the future. So we're excited about what this is going to mean for the tribe when it comes to exercising our sovereignty and possibly jurisdiction going forward in terms of our water code. Now you got me going. Uh, that's <laughs> what we like to do. <laughs> um, and we had a hand raise from Peter Olmstead. Peter, go ahead. Hi, James. Yep. Hi, James. This is uh, this is great. Thank you so much. Um, I had a couple. Well, I wanted to share a couple of the main hurdles we typically run into with uh, when we're trying to consult with the tribes. Um, one is the timeline we're on. Um, you know, I, so I work for the Corps of Engineers. We've got a mm. We've got 60 and 120 day clocks for uh, making a permit decision. And so um, we that that timeline is perhaps not always sufficient for the tribes to provide us with that meaningful feedback. And then I guess the second thing is um, we we sometimes have to deliver bad news and mainly it, it in those cases, it's because we don't have 
the authority to do what the tribe would like us to do in that particular scenario. We, mm -hmm. we um, you know, like my agency, we're looking at the Clean Water Act. We don't regulate uh, transporting oil on a railroad. That's the Federal Railroad Administration. So do you have any advice for us um, in consulting and dealing with those, those two particular issues and um, how can we gain ground there? Yeah, well, those are great questions. I know, um, I mean, just let's just be honest with you. You're, I mean, don't, don't say <laughs> Corps of Engineer any tribal meeting or if you wanna get, get booted out. So you know, just the whole, you're dealing with, uh, you're already going uphill now with just a rec name recognition of your organization. Number one, you know, and I, I know you got tribal liaisons. I think um, I'd be curious to know what the tribal liaisons think about your questions. Um, it seems to me that you know they should be preparing the ground all the time, whether they're giving good news or bad news to the tribes. Those liaisons have an important job. You know, they're at an interface between your group and the tribes. They should know the tribes through and out. They should know the leadership. They should know the councils and such. Even though you know, I know it's a big, big ask. Maybe you need more travel liaisons to address that, to support uh, those efforts that you're talking about. But you know, you just need that, you just need that bi-directional communication. You need a platform to share information in more effective ways, I think. Uh, I think the also part that I, I think liaisons play is that you know they're they're the ones that you know should be on the ground again and working directly with travel governments and that too. And so, you know, that, I, that's all I have, man. But yeah, that's a hard question. Um, if I look at it from a tribal perspective, from a tribal resource manager, then, you know, Mike, you know, I'm, I'm very skeptical about the Corps of Engineer. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, there are things that we got to do and things that we've got to understand. And I know um, it's a very difficult time for you all. And I, I think that, uh, but again, uh, my best answer right now is, is your tribal liaisons. They should be always um, on the ground informing you as well as informing the tribe about what's happening. That, that's just that's just needed. You can't you can't bypass communication. That's just part of I think the strategy that's got to be done. I would just add, Peter. Also, you know, considering you. what James shared about the four R's, <laughs> wherever you can incorporate that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I just want to make sure we have any other questions. And um, I think we we posted we had a little bit more time than we did for today. But if folks have questions, I don't want anybody to feel rushed. And um, I posted in the chat um, that we actually had a, a video we were planning to share with the COP on the care principles. So you all have it now. <laughs> um, with our partners at the Native Nations Institute. Um, few things, James, that you shared that I just I want to emphasize, and I don't know if I was catching on the right on the the right bits, but maybe it'll be helpful for others. Is um, a lot of your work kind of one you're working in so many different areas, but they're mm -hmm. all so connected to bringing people together, um, providing uh, tribal voices and self determination in in how the land is, the relationships with the land, how the tribe connects with the land, how others connect to the land, and also acknowledging that it, it's not all one group or another group, right? Even even in bringing the, 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 the Great Sioux Nation, right? It's not just one Lakota tribe, it's all the Lakota tribes. And you were sharing with uh, Betsy Daniels and the folks at Triangle Associates, um, you know, it's not, it's kind of we're all all hands on deck. It's not just native and non-native, but all the voices, all the folks. I really appreciated that you were talking about um, working with tribal colleges and tribal youth, because mm -hmm. um, I think that touches not only on what what I've heard in my work of the need to build tribal capacity and youth capacity to do this work, mm -hmm. but also recognizing that youth are kind of that connection between the now and the future. Um, and so, uh, it's also a re they're, they're uh, not to call them a resource, but they're, they're the future resource to continue this work and these connections. So, um, just little tidbits of, of everything you always share, just kind of 
wanted to wanted to share with the rest of the group. <laughs> well, that's a. I think that's a good observation, Stephanie. Um, I mean, I get. I don't know if people are criticizing me or, or what they're taking shots at me or because they said you're all over the place or you're doing all this stuff. You know, how do you do it? Do you get do you get even sleep at night? Well, I, I, can I tell you a secret? Tell you my secret? Well, I, I don't. I don't do it that much. I don't do that much. Um, <laughs> I, I I'm just part of great teams, and I think you know, I mentioned the word team science uh, in the work that we're doing at Easel. It's it's another trying to find a better way to get science to break down those walls between each other, the different disciplines to address something like climate change, something complex like climate change. Um, I think you know. In this time, you know, we need the kind of leaders with cultural intelligence. They, they know how to they know how to cross those boundaries uh, to work with someone different than themselves. That's why I practice try to practice those tools and share those tools and and, and, and teach, share my learnings. I am. Um, I was just on a call this morning. Um, I was asked to give a keynote at the NOAA Postal GIS conference in, in February. And I was meeting with with folks there this morning, talking about you know you know what sort of what's needed now going forward in working with tribal nations and tribal engagement. And I I just stressed a point again that there are though I'm not the only one doing this kind of work, right? I'm just one of many. Uh, but in my life and in my career, I find now that I've never saw so much interest now in tribal nations, probably in my whole life. This is way new for me too. And so we're all new to this in some ways about this interest. And somebody said, well, are you promoting uh, engage, tribal engagement fatigue by, by doing, <laughs> by all trying to all, uh, you know, approach the tribe, say, hey, let's work together. But I think that, you know, I think that, you know, these are the opportunities now. And I, I, I'll say it again to your audience is that, you know, to work with tribes, we need to do it now. And I think that um, we've been saying we want this, we, we've been saying we need this. Um, this and that uh, for many years, right? And so, you know, UDAL has an important role to play. You know, I, I'm not sure if you guys call yourself a boundary organization or you're part of the government, but, but you know, these kind of voices are needed to bring together. I, I mentioned the, the term leadership matters. You know, we need the kind of leaders that's going to recognize this opportunity we have today. We need leaders really to work deeply into traditional knowledge and indigenous people. I remind people that we don't separate people from the knowledge. So you, so you need us. If you're going to talk about traditional knowledge, then you need, you need people as part of that, not just write a book on traditional knowledge and give it to me or do a workshop on traditional knowledge and now I know it. No, it's a it's a it's a it's different than that. And so we have to build those mechanisms of those engagements, right? You got to do those things really that's going to create a better future for for all of us. And that's why I do my work. And again, so I promote that as it's not the easiest job on I call myself a generalist, so I'm not a specialist. I'm a generalist, so I work with different things, um, just trying to advance things, communicate, talk about, raise issues, ask good questions, and then try to do some things, right? This new climate center is gonna be an example of that. And maybe part of my legacy, if you will, if I'm thinking about that right now, what, what's that center gonna look like for future generations? That in 2022 uh, of November, the tribe got its first climate center. 20 years later, this is what it did, this is what it did, and this is how it helped the tribe or help the state of South Dakota or help the nation in terms of how we how we use our different different knowledges to address things. So, so those things are 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 part of who I am. And um, and I, there are other people like me. I, I'm not I'm not that unique, but um, but I find myself uh, as friends and colleagues with Steph with Steph Lucero and uh, um, here I find myself. Well, I think that's actually a great note, given that so many of the folks on the line today are facilitators, mediators. Our job is bringing people together, bringing those yeah. those great teams that can work together and and sometimes work through conflicts and differences and differences opinions and find some common ground. So um, I think that's the the perfect way to to point out that we're all we're all doing our part to bring people together in difficult conversations and find some so solutions together, ask the right questions. Um, I just want to see, do we have any other questions or comments from the group? Uh, I always like just chatting with James, but obviously fo other folks might want to ch chat with James before we sign off. We're a little over. 
you know, um, I gave a talk um, to a Canadian, Canadian audience in British Columbia several months ago, very similar to what I did here today. And there they called me a generative, generative whirlwind. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I don't know if I know what it means, but I could guess. <laughs> what was their intent? I don't know. I, I still have to figure that out. Was it a Canadian thing or they just wanted to dig at me or something? But I, I, well, I mean, I, you know, I think part of, part of this work too is, is a sense of humor. I mean, um, you know, if you know me, I, you know, I, I tend to you know, use humor a lot in my work uh, in terms of building uh, friendships and building collegiality. And don't forget, you know, you know, Indigenous people have a great sense of humor. Um, I, you know, I, I feel it's a compliment, you know, when people do compliment me with a sense of humor that, that I may have. I know, uh, I know my wife doesn't think I have a sense of humor. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> I think I do, but she doesn't. Well, I mean, but I do think seriously that, that, you know, developing your toolkit, if you will, and working your sense of humor is important. Um, I think we can never know enough in a way about each other. Um, so, you know, we need those frameworks to really, you know, what are those things like cultural intelligence that'll help us, to help us um, have those conversations. Something said, well, James, are you advocating people change? And I say, well, it's like, how do you change but stay the same? You know, like I advocate that you, you're, you're who you are. And that's who you are. And I'm, I don't say you got to be like me or you'd be like another native person. No, I don't I don't mean that. I don't believe that. And I don't practice that. It's the question is that, you know, we want to we want to maintain our integrity of who we are as an identity. And same way with indigenous people, you know, we we want to we want to be who we are. But because you know Western science is 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 not who we are in a way, but we know that we need we need it. We know that we these other kind of tools that are out there that really not indigenous, but yet we need it. And so, how do we work with how to become a scientist and yet stay who we are? You know, and then it becomes you know like who we are is an identity issue. And I do think that that's part of what you may find in indigenous communities. And what I what I want to do is expand. Um, I network with indigenous people. You know, I want to go beyond just America um, and I'm starting to work in Canada. You know, Canada, British Columbia has over 250 First Nations. They're the most diverse province in Canada. 250. This is one province. I mean, how would you even work there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and they're all different. And they're small, they're big, you know, culturally they're different, linguistically they're different. And yet the province is charged with working with all of them. And so we, we need, you know, more effective frameworks to how to do engagement, whatever that looks like. You know, we need research. Uh, we need social scientists to work with us on these kind of things. You know, what's, what's, what's the new indigenous person going to look like? You know, is, are they going to be like my grandchildren, you know, with different ethnicities growing up in, in urban areas, but yet still, um, still are members of tribes? And again, what does that mean? So I think, you know, we have a lot of things coming before us even as indigenous people that we are sort of wrestling with and there's tension in those sort of things. So they were asking you to come in and understand that. Well, that's asking a lot. So that's why, you know, we need brokers, uh, we need liaisons, we need bridge builders always from both sides. And I do appreciate the question about, you know, what, is it, what does it mean to be a good ally? And I think that, you know, I think we've had a good allies all along in our history. Um, they, they just did the work. Uh, and I think we re we have recognized that, uh, and I think there still needs a need for great allies. Uh, we just need to do it in ways that you know, meet both our needs. Again, as I mentioned, done in, in good ways. So, well, thank you so much, James. I'm I'm not I'm I'm hearing a lot of thank yous over and over again, and I do want to remind folks and thank you again, James, for um, letting us record this, and it will okay. be available on the YouTube, and you can share it. Okay. Um, and I want to just say thank you, and I'm I'm really happy that the timing worked out that we get to celebrate with you in that funding for your your project, your maybe future legacy work. Well. <laughs> Well, hopefully it's a legacy. That's good. We get bad legacies too. So, but you good know, one. I think, um, well, I think for me, I guess I'll just close out with this by saying that, you know, these things that we're doing, I'm part of, it's been great, um, great opportunity. And that picture I sent you with all the people on the, on the slide, 
you, you take a look at those people. I mean, they're, they're, they're notable in themselves. And I had the real opportunity to work with them. And I think we should all here just remember again the people that we work with from, from within the tribal nations and within the science community, within America, our organizations. You know, there are really a lot of good people doing really good work. And uh, we get the opportunity to work with them, to learn from them. And even if the opportunity presents itself uh, to, to do things and to become friends. And, you know, one of the things that Lakota means is allies. The word Lakota means allies, translated to be allies in the English. So Ken, it doesn't surprise that you believe that, that I, I and others like me are, are in this space and we're doing this work. And um, I'm known, I've known that, you know, our culture has been shared pretty readily with, with many people around the world, Lakota culture. And I think we'll continue to do that. And we're not all like all tribes, tribes are not all like us, and that's okay. Um, but we have to be who we are. And um, I think the Udall Foundation has a long legacy, a good history of working with Indian nations. And, and as you mentioned, doing the hard work, the complex work that needs to be done. Uh, but I would say just as a word of encouragement to all of you, this stuff that, uh, that you know, this is important and you know, it's for all our children um, that what we do and um, as a grandfather maybe your grandfather grandmothers too um, that yeah, we're doing it for those folks as well so keep up the good work stay encouraged uh, communicate your work with, with others share your work and uh, and be a good relative all right with that we will bid everybody good afternoon good evening for those on the east coast and thank you james for joining us today i'm, I'm glad we made this happen finally <laughs> all right very good thank you stephanie everybody take care be safe bye bye thank you